What is the difference between covert and overt surveillance and when would each type be used? Welcome to the PI Guy channel. My name is John Morris. I am a licensed professional private investigator. When we think of private investigators, most often the first thing that comes to mind is surveillance and rightfully so, as surveillance for many PIs is the bread and butter of their business and surveillance is also the most common type of investigation that private investigators do. As well, covert surveillance is what we generally think of when we do think of a private investigator conducting surveillance. This is when the PI is doing surveillance in a covert or hidden way. If done right, the subject will never become aware of the surveillance. If done wrong, that can be disastrous for the investigator and for the entire investigation. Covert surveillance is typically accomplished through stationary, mobile, or a combination of the two types of surveillance. Stationary covert surveillance is most often conducted with a PI sitting in a surveillance vehicle down the street or at a distance watching for the subject and any activity at the subject's location. Covert stationary surveillance could also be conducted by the placement of hidden cameras watching the location of the subject where the PI could monitor those cameras live or review the video captured at a later point in time. I have also had cases where I was conducting covert stationary surveillance while sitting in a coffee shop, fast food restaurant, library, and other public places where I could see the subject's location, but those opportunities are rare. Stationary surveillance where the PI is sitting inside a vehicle is the most common way and requires the private investigator to utilize tactics to remain covert. These tactics may include sitting in the back seat, utilizing dark tinted windows, having blackout devices in the windows so no one can see inside the vehicle, and other strategies to ensure they remain undetected. Typically, while on covert stationary surveillance, the PI not only doesn't want to be seen by the subject of the investigation, but they also do not want to be noticed by nosy neighbors or anyone else for that matter. In most cases, a PI doing stationary surveillance will, in fact, end up doing mobile surveillance at some level during the course of the surveillance too. When a PI is conducting covert mobile surveillance, there are specific strategies he may employ as well to ensure the integrity of the investigation. Some of these tactics for mobile surveillance in a vehicle include following at a distance, following in another lane of traffic, and utilizing other vehicles to block the subject from seeing the PI's vehicle. A good surveillance investigator will also be keeping an eye out for obstacles and hazards well ahead of the subject, making a note of special markings on the subject vehicle and doing pre-surveillance research to determine the subject's activities. A more difficult type of mobile surveillance is what we refer to as foot surveillance. This can be more difficult because of many factors. If the subject goes on foot, then gets on a bus, or takes a taxi, an Uber, or any of those rental bikes we see all over in larger cities, then suddenly the PI may be left in the cold with no way to continue the follow. While conducting covert foot surveillance, the investigator must keep an eye on the subject and remain aware of the subject's awareness of their surroundings. Obviously, you need to do this on mobile surveillance in a vehicle too, but while on foot surveillance, the subject may become aware of the PI more often as it is easier to identify the PI by clothing, their face, their gait, and other easily identifying characteristics. So if covert surveillance is where you stay hidden from the subject, what is overt surveillance? Overt surveillance refers to conducting surveillance in a manner where the activity of surveillance is not being hidden, or in layman's terms, it is being done in the wide open for all, including the subject, to see. As with stationary covert surveillance, the utilization of cameras or other means of technology may be used, but again, they are not always disguised. And looking at this from a logical standpoint, it is very counterintuitive to conduct overt surveillance for the vast majority of cases a PI may be involved in. But there are specific situations that may arise that require this more aggressive type of surveillance. Let me tell you about an exciting case I had where we had to go from covert to overt surveillance. The case was a domestic case where the subject, husband of the client, had been arrested for domestic abuse. The client had hired us to keep an eye on him while he was out on bond and while they were going through the divorce proceedings to gather evidence of him drinking, drinking and driving, using drugs, and other bad behavior. This sounds like the typical domestic situation we often get involved in as PIs, but the major difference in this case was he was charged with attempted murder, among other heinous crimes. 
Due to the nature of the charges, the client obviously wanted to ensure he would not be around her or their kids, if at all possible. This case went on for months, as most domestic cases do, but as time went by, the primary focus of the case changed. During routine surveillance, we observed him going to liquor stores, drinking, partying, and doing many other questionable things. We also had indications that he may be preparing to go to see the client or be in the area where she was. Now, she had moved out of town, and he had a TRO, a temporary restraining order, stating he couldn't go anywhere near her, the kids, or her family. But due to his employment, location of his friends, and his odd behavior, he was often observed getting dangerously close to where she resided. We then got the opportunity to turn over some of our findings to the DA, the district attorney, for review. And they ended up having him arrested for violating his restraining order, which also included a stipulation wherein he had to refrain from the use or possession of drugs or alcohol. But once we did this, well, the gig was up. He knew from that point on that he was being surveilled. However, due to confidentiality, he was not made aware of who was surveilling him. Then he became very suspicious after bonding out. We had to go from one surveillance operative to two at that point. Then his behavior started to become more erratic. He started randomly going for drives in directions where he thought he might be going toward the client. He also was doing more evasive counter surveillance activities like driving around the block, changing up driving speeds, quickly entering and exiting shopping centers and things like that. At this point, the client and her family became very worried about his actions. After discussing this with the client, her attorneys, the DA, and the police, we were fairly confident he did not know who had surveilled him. The family then asked us to go over versus covert on our surveillance endeavors. At this point, the entire game had changed. We had to throw out the old game plan and write a new one. Some of our biggest concerns were that he would become aggressive towards us, call the police in fear of his own life, or go out to try to do something even worse. We did make contact with the local police who were quite familiar with him and the charges against him and informed them we would be conducting overt surveillance. We needed to do this as we knew neighbors would also see us and start calling the police. We also needed them to know we were doing overt surveillance in the event we required police assistance for any reason. Now this is where the case got quite interesting. At this point, we went to 24-hour surveillance seven days a week with two or three investigators depending on the time of day. We would leave one surveillance investigator positioned overtly in the neighborhood to watch for activity, and we had the other investigators outside the neighborhood so they could pick up the follow once he went active. When we went on mobile surveillance, it was usually overtly too, but we still maintained our distance as we did not want to cause him to panic or do anything irrational. We just wanted the subject to know we were watching him. We also usually had one of the investigators, when we had three working, stay covert, so we had that third set of eyes on him that he was not aware of. In the long run, this case went quite well. He became aware of us, obviously, and he even got comfortable with us to a certain point, like waving to the investigators, often with a single finger. He did end up getting divorced with no parental visitations allowed, and he did get a new place to stay for a while at the state correctional facility. I am fairly certain he thought we were the police following him, and we were fine letting him think that too, as it helped ensure a safer investigation and a positive outcome. Other cases we have had that involved overt versus covert surveillance include situations where we were protecting physical assets, ensuring a subject did not go near those protected assets, and other rare domestic cases. And rare is the key word here. Rarely would a PI ever do overt surveillance as it is counterintuitive and counterproductive for the vast majority of the cases we work. Most of our surveillance cases are quite dull, quite predictable, and most definitely entirely covert. And if you would like to see what a typical surveillance case is like, well, I made this live surveillance video right here that goes into those details, so check it out now. Really quick, I want to send a shout out to the PI Guy Premium Channel supporters. Eric Hutchinson, Nick STL, and Eric Lewis, thank you so much for your support.